So twice you've described U.S. presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. Президенты приходят и уходят, а политика не меняется. Знаете почему? Потому что очень сильна власть бюрократии. Вот человека избрали, он приходит с одними идеями, к нему приходят люди с кейсами, хорошо одетые и в темных, как у меня, костюмах, но только не с красным галстуком, а с черным или, или с темно-синим, и начинают объяснять, как нужно делать. И все сразу меняется, понимаете? Это, и это происходит от одной администрации к другой. Вот что-то изменить... But what Putin said last night describing the conversation with Bill Clinton and then George W. Bush underscores that although we have this perception that presidents are in charge and they're the ultimate decision makers, a lot of times they get sandbagged and circumvented by their subordinates. So I think Putin in that interview really showed some insight into how the deep state works and how it's thwarted peace. Because if uh, Russia would have been brought into NATO, the reason for NATO to exist would have disappeared. And then we wouldn't have to spend all that money on building up all these weapon systems to fight the uh, imaginary enemy that Russia is supposed to be. The, partly the reason why our foreign policy has been so interventionist, has been so destructive, been so costly, has been such a big failure, is that an unelected group around the presidency in what we now call the deep state, the National Security Council, all of the 17 different intelligence agencies deep in the bowels of the State Department and the National Endowment for Democracy, to say nothing to the Pentagon and, uh, you know, the military industrial complex and all the NGOs and all the think tanks. I mean, there's literally dozens and dozens of think tanks who live one way or another off government money through the back door or foundation money uh, that's in the business of promoting the empire, promoting the neocon view of the world, promoting our intervention everywhere from the Idlib, Idlib province uh, in Syria uh, to uh, we're still, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I note again, Mr. Trump, to his credit, wanted us to get out. And he was essentially vetoed by what some call the deep state, uh, which is the neocon infested uh, political leadership that he installed at the head of American agencies. We talked to uh, American military officers for the most part. They don't want. They don't want to get into a war with Iran. They don't. They don't. CIA projects, uh, Operation Mockingbird. Uh, how they controlled hundreds of journalists directly on the payroll. They printed hundreds of books. They infiltrated student unions, labor unions. They actually wrote articles for some mainstream journalists uh, uh, in the 70s, 80s, and in 90s. And anyone who believes that the CIA is intimately now involved in crafting the narrative about Ukraine, Syria, Libya, uh, the Middle East, Yemen, and of course, Israel. Anyone who can, can believe that is exceptionally naive and needs to re-educate themselves about the reality of how the CIA operates. But unhinged capitalism is destroying my own nation, the United States and uh, threatening the world because it's it's the military industrial complex that Dwight D. Eisenhower warned us about, and he was part of himself, but he saw it as he was leaving his presidency and warned America about it. It has now taken control of both parties, Republican and Democratic Party. And we have now been feeding this war machine for decades, endless wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Right, has APAC corrupted the Congress? It would be a lie if I said no. Uh, just reading Walton Mearsheimer's Israel lobby and knowing what I know and what I have seen in my some 12 long years of exposure to the process at the highest levels, APAC owns the Congress in a real sense. And when it comes to voting and key votes, committee or whole house or Senate, they own the majority to do it. 
In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? You know, President Eisenhower in his farewell address uh, wrote about and warned against the power of the uh, military-industrial complex. Uh, if I make a farewell address, I think I would warn against the media elitist complex. You know, the media is always talking about uh, the imperial presidency, the power of the imperial presidency. I think we ought to hear a little bit of discussion of the imperial media and its power. You see, presidential power is limited, limited by the courts, limited by the Congress. The media's power is unlimited. And, and the final word on the think tanks, the think tanks in the United States, almost down to the last one of any consequence anyway, are no longer independent. They are owned by the people who keep them financially afloat. And those are large corporations, mainly but not exclusively in the financial sector and two maverick billionaires like the Koch brothers, hmm. who have totally taken over things like the Cato Institute. Uh, and they're doing the same at universities as well, where they're taking over programs and centers through donations that come with strings attached, and the universities don't have the integrity to reject them. You had, you had folks who went from the State Department directly, for example, to the Atlantic Council, which was which was this major facilitator uh, between the government uh, between government to government censorship. The Atlantic Council is a group that was one of Biden's biggest political backers. They they uh, they build themselves as NATO's think tank, so they represent the political census of NATO. And in many respects, when when NATO has uh, civil society actions that they want to be coordinated. To, to synchronize with military action in a region, the Atlantic Council essentially is deployed to consensus build and make that political action happen within a region of interest to NATO. Now, the Atlantic Council has seven CIA directors on its board. A lot of people don't even know that seven CIA directors are still alive, let alone all concentrated on, on the board of a single organization that's kind of the heavyweight in the censorship industry. They get annual funding from the Department of Defense, the State Department, and CIA cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy. The Atlantic Council in January 2017 moved immediately to pressure European governments to pass censorship laws to create a transatlantic flank attack on free speech in exactly the way that Rick Stengel essentially called for to have U.S. mimic European censorship laws. Basically, the, the field of censorship science fuses together two disparate groups of study, if you will. There's the sort of political and social scientists who are the sort of thought leaders of what should be censored. And then there are the sort of quants, if you will. These are the programmers, the computational data scientists, computational linguistics. Every university, there's over 60 universities now who get federal government grants to do this censorship, uh, the censorship work and the censorship preparation work. The term neocon simply applied to anyone who uh, uh, subscribed to the famous, if not infamous, uh, Wolfowitz Memorandum of March 1992, and that should be really the point of reference for anyone desirous of, of thinking through and, and, and finding whatever coherence, at least in a broad strategic sense, that American foreign policy thinking has. The basics of the Wolfowitz doct Doctrine now form the foundation for the extraordinary consensus in the American foreign policy com community in support of a strategy which indeed does aim to reinforce American hegemony and to be very assertive and proactive in trying to undermine those emerging powers which might challenge it. Well, because the, the, the goal of the West is to take and steal the resources of Russia. They want them all for themselves. The gold, the oil, the uranium, 
the gas, the nickel, uh, the nitrogen. You know, the, Russia has a vast, vast uh, mineral resources, and the West wants them, and they want to take them. So this is um, th this is the equivalent of uh, rape, only it's economic rape. But the United States is going to take it by force and consume it for itself. It's a war that should have never happened. It's a war that Russians tried repeatedly to settle on terms that were very, very beneficial to Ukraine and us. The major thing they wanted was for us to keep NATO out of the Ukraine. The big military contractors want to add new countries to NATO all the time. Why? Because then that country has to conform its military purchases and NATO weapon specifications, which means certain companies, Northrop North Grumman, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and Lockheed, get a trapped market. Through March of 2022, we committed $113 billion. Just to give you an example, we could have built a home for almost every homeless person in this country. We then committed another $24 billion since then, two months ago, and now President Biden is asking for another $60 billion. But the big, big expenses are going to come after the war, when we have to rebuild you all the things that we destroyed. Mitch McConnell was asked, can we really afford to spend $113 billion to Ukraine? He said, don't worry. It's not really going to Ukraine. It's, it's going, going to, to American defense manufacturers. So he just admitted it's a money laundering scheme. And who do you think owns every one of those companies? Yeah, BlackRock. So Tim Scott during the Republican debate said, don't worry, it's not a gift to Ukraine, it's a loan. So raise your hand if you think that that loan's ever getting paid back. Yeah, of course it's not. So why do they call it a loan? Because if they call it a loan, they can impose loan conditions. And what are the loan conditions that we impose on? Number one, of extreme austerity program. So that if you're poor in Ukraine, you're going to be poor forever. Number two, most important, Ukraine has to put all of its government-owned assets up for sale to multinational corporations, including all of its agricultural land, the biggest single asset in Europe, in Ukraine. There's been a thousand years of war fought over that land is the richest farmland in the world. It's the breadbasket of Europe. 500,000 kids almost, Ukrainians have died to keep that land as part of Ukraine. They almost certainly didn't know about this loan condition. They've already sold 30% of it. The buyers were DuPont, Cargill, and Monsanto. Who do you think owns all of those companies? Yeah, BlackRock. And then, in December, President Biden gave out the contract to rebuild Ukraine. And who do you think got that contract? Akra. It's it, the one, I, it's, it's the Green Party, okay? But I don't mean the environmentally, collect, I mean the green one with the money. You know, the Benjamin Franklin Green Party. Those hundred dollar bills. That's where, that's where this comes down. That, uh, the the military the you know the military industrial uh, corporations that benefit from all these government contracts it's not just the military it's the pharmaceutical industry it's the agricultural industry you've got you know the united states is passing out lots of money to some very uh, large organizations